Hoy en la taberna de rol tenemos a Adam Bradford Él es el Chief Development Officer de Demiplane Que es una herramienta digital, una serie de herramientas digitales Donde se pueden armar personajes, consultar libros Y ver un montón de herramientas de muchos juegos Entre ellos Pathfinder, Vampire, Baesen, varios más Le vamos a preguntar cómo es esto de tener una serie de herramientas digitales ¿Qué lo diferencia de una mesa virtual, una BTT? ¿Qué ve en el futuro? ¿Qué sabe? de sus usuarios de esta herramienta, qué pasa con Latinoamérica y la localización y las traducciones y muchas, muchas cosas más que la verdad nos van a dar una visión muy interesante de hacia dónde va la industria de los juegos de rol. Quédate porque ya mismo empieza. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for, for being in, an, in our interview. You are the, the chief development officer at uh, Demiplane, is that right? I mean, uh, what is in your words, before we start uh, delving into it, Demiplane, if you had to define it in your own words. Yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll maybe start with that Chief Development Officer uh, title because a lot of right. people have no idea <laughs> what that is. And uh, it, it is a gloriously made up title. So um, I have uh, <laughs> thankfully gotten to the point in my career where um, I can just have made up titles. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's great. I never thought I'd get here. But um, uh, it, it is actually a uh, job that um, is often used in the construction industry. Um, of all things. Um, and uh, and so when we were looking at the different things that I would be doing for Demi Plain, uh, we uh, tried to group it into this generic title as much as possible. But ultimately, I end up doing, um, I am uh, leading our product efforts um, is uh, definitely one of the primary things that I do. Um, and I lead business development. So all of our partner uh, relationships, publisher relationships, uh, all of those things. I also um, work on community development. So um, anything that is community management or um, any kind of uh, interaction and engagement with the community, all of that falls under me. And so, uh, so again, we were just trying to find something that would unify those uh, kitchen sink um, you know, uh, elements as, as much as we could. So that's Chief Development Officer. And I joined Demiplane, it's been, uh, goodness, about, it's been over three years ago um, at, at this stage. And of course I left uh, Fandom and D&D Beyond uh, to go uh, directly uh, to Demiplane. So after I had started D&D Beyond, uh, the entire time that I was there, I wanted to provide these high quality digital tools for all the other games owners because I absolutely play Dungeons and Dragons. I love it. Um, it uh, has been a mainstay in my life for decades now, but I also play all of these other games and I love many of them. Many of these publishers are uh, doing this uh, just extremely excellent work. And unfortunately, Um, I, uh, you know, even after I started D&D Beyond, the thing that I kept hearing from even friends that I was wanting to play with was, you know, hey, I want to try this game from Free League or I want to try Pathfinder. And it was always, is there something like DDB for that game? And the answer, of course, was no. And it's and, and then I couldn't get anybody to play with me. And so even while I was, uh, you know, working um, on D&D Beyond, And, and leading that, I was wanting to do it for other games. And it became very clear that that wasn't going to be a possibility um, as uh, the trajectory of D&D Beyond was going on, because I could see what was happening with Wizards of the Coast. And, um, and, and so in order to go and provide those digital tools for these other games that I love, uh, that is when I joined Demiplane. And, and Demiplane is a uh, company that's been around for, uh, you know, right at four years, I think at this point, but it was started by Peter Romanesco and Travis Frederick. Uh, Travis used to play for the Dallas Cowboys, uh, yes. American football. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, he, uh, was an all pro center there and, uh, uh, great player, but, um, but he actually left that career because he always wanted to do software development. And so, He had gotten together with his lifelong childhood friend, Peter Romanesco, um, who is our CEO. And they started this company 
uh, that was really centered in those early days around uh, matchmaking and helping people find games because uh, we all know that that is uh, a very uh, challenging part of the process if we haven't been introduced like many many of us like like me who have played for a long long time the only way i knew about this game is a friend or a family member you know pulled me into it so uh so it was you know easier to find groups in that way but it also meant that hardly anybody was coming to the hobby because it was very insular um and so um so as we uh as demiplane was kicking off it's like hey you know we want to help people find games is how it uh, really started out well it did a really good job of that so we've got this very um you know proprietary fantastic algorithm for for matching interests and everything else and it works really really well but then people would find their groups and then they would not have any reason for demi plane uh, to be around anymore because you know it, it's done its job and so it's very similar to the problem that a lot of dating applications have that it's like hey you know it, once you have conversion no one's coming back there if, if uh you know they end up marrying so uh so basically um this is uh, uh kind of what demi plane was running into and so about that time i was looking to make that uh journey into providing the digital tools for the other games. And Peter and Travis were looking to uh, move Demiplane into a different direction uh, that is uh, that was a little more tool-based. And so as uh, we met each other, uh, we were talking, we got to know each other through playing a game. It was a Star Wars uh, uh, role-playing game that we were playing. Um, but um, we got to talking, said, hey, do you want to do this for Pathfinder? They said, yeah, that sounds great. And so uh, my first day in the office, I'm pretty sure it was the first day, maybe second, we had a meeting with Paizo to uh, say, hey, do you want to do something like D&D Beyond for Pathfinder? Yes, please. And, and so it just all, all went on from there. And so at this stage, we have, um, I believe we're at five or six games, let's see, um, that that are ha uh, that have character tools. And I may be off on that uh, number because uh, we've got a couple internally that are working right now that might not be public yet. But um, but we um, we also are supporting uh, you know close to uh, you know nine or ten games in um, at least early access, which is providing content. And so finally, getting back around to your original question, Demi Plane is focused on providing those high quality digital tools for games that aren't uh, Dungeons and Dragons. And, um, and in those digital tools, the core focus for us is on content and characters, because there are uh, dozens, if not hundreds of virtual tabletops out there now. And uh, what I've discovered over the years uh, with all the data I've been able to see um, is that uh, preferences are very strong when it comes to virtual tabletops. There, uh, there, there are people that, that love various VTTs and they will go to the map for those VTTs. And one of the things that um, I saw with D&D Beyond is that virtual tabletops, even though Roll20 and Fantasy Grounds had been official Wizards of the Coast partners for going on two years before D, uh, DDB even entered the scene. D&D Beyond um, was uh, twice as large as um, you know Roll20, the next nearest Roll20 within an 18 month span. And a lot of the reason that we saw that that was happening was because VTTs have trouble with characters. And so I always ask the question, um, you know, can you play these games without a virtual tabletop? And of course the answer is yes, like we absolutely can. And then I rhetorically ask, can you play these questions, uh, these games without characters? And of course the answer is no. And so this is where for Demi playing, um, and, and what I did in the past life, but, but here at Demi Plain, we really want to focus on making sure that that character's experience is, is world-class, the best that you can possibly have. And then also we want the content experience. So the, the ability to read the book content, uh, on a phone and, and all these, you know, any kind of device, anywhere that you are, those are all, um, you know, really, really big things for us. So content and characters are where we focus and, uh, and we're going to continue expanding the games that we support. Uh, we've got some, uh, uh big, uh, secrets that I can't talk about that are coming out even later this year that we can't, uh, can't wait for, for people to see, uh, on the content character side. That's amazing. So 
I will uh, change a little bit a uh, question that I had because you already about it, uh, uh, on board it. Uh, never, never mind. Got it. So you you have stated the some some difference uh, between what is a bit a BTT and a digital toolset. Uh, have you ever considered adding a BTT to Demiplane? You are working on a lot. You you just said it, but it's it's something that's quite near. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. And um, I certainly do not want to give the impression. I would never say never on that. Um, is, is is maybe the best way to put that. Um, I believe that um, you know uh, years from now, when we have uh, you know covered the games that we want to cover, and we have uh, you know uh, proven our uh, you know hypotheses right about having that best content and characters experience for all the games that we support. Um, when we are looking out at what other features we might add, then um, a virtual tabletop at some point could absolutely make sense. I believe that the more likely uh, path for us to take, because again, um, you know, another thing that I have figured out in uh, eight, eight or nine years now of working with online communities and just the emerging online presence in our world today is that there is no accounting for taste and preference. Um, So again, as I was referring to with VTTs, um, people are staunch defenders of all their different varieties of the kinds that they want. And so um, our preference and something that we will probably even get into this year um, is, it, you know, is what it looks like on our roadmap right now is the concept of integration with existing virtual tabletops. And so we will likely see the ability for you to take characters and even content. Um, in the DDB days, there was a, a, a simple Chrome extension that's called Beyond 20 yes. um, that, that allows you to, um, you know, and that's somebody from the community uh, put that together. Now, of course, at the time, I knew with some of our constraints with Wizards of the Coast that um, we weren't going to get to develop that. But um, I was very happy and encouraged the community to do those things. Uh, at Demiplane, we are not working with Wizards of the Coast and the publishers we are working with are far more open um, to uh, what I will call uh, community-centric uh, policies and, and approaches and standards. And so, uh, you know, uh, the publishers that we're working with have no issues with this whatsoever. And so we will be, you know, the first step of this is an export to PDF. But, um, but when we start getting character information in an exportable format, then it's, it's just another bridge that we have to build to get that into some of these uh, VTTs that people are very excited about. So, um, so I think that that is the more likely path for us to take anytime soon, because another gap that I think exists, we, we, could, we could do content and characters uh, and then move into VTT, but I think that uh, what I call challenge management Um, is is also a big gap when it comes to um, you know a lot of the tools that are out there right now. So what I mean by that is if characters is the player character side of things, then the creatures and monsters and adversaries and all of that is is what I'm calling challenges and, and grouping those together. I believe that you know what does it look like to have a monster or creature builder for Pathfinder where you can quickly and easily uh, you know spin those things up as a game master. Um, that is likely a place that we would go before we would go um, to, to any kind of virtual tabletop functionality, and we'll focus on integration instead. In, in the meantime. Okay, that's that's great uh, so using that as an as an intro to the subject uh i i have a question just just for you uh when did you personally first realize that there was a need for a digital tool set for role playing games like uh i i guess that i really think that there is a moment like oh yeah. how, how was yeah. that when, when did you decided to do that yeah that That, that's a great question. I actually don't uh, get that one uh, asked too often. Uh, but uh, but with um, 
I will never forget the the first role playing game that I ever played was um, the Star Wars West End Games um, role role playing game. Uh, so it was a you know mountain of d6s when you, I'm rolling that blaster rifle you know? and uh, I absolutely adore that game uh, to this day and um, and so um, started playing with that because I actually I, I, I still live in uh, Huntsville Alabama and this is very much so in the heart of the Bible belt and the satanic panic um, was a real real thing in this area uh, where, where I grew up and um, uh, and and so as that um, you know was playing out for whatever reason it was okay for Jedi to use the mystical energy field that binds us all together with a force but but it was crossing a line for us to you know cast a magic fireball right and so uh, so basically we stayed away from from D d initially. But then um, I was far too curious. I had watched a cartoon when I was a kid. My parents didn't care about uh, a lot of that nonsense. And so they let me do whatever. Um, but um, but basically, um, I had loved the concept of D&D well before I played it. I was in you know my remediation uh, classes um, at, at school you know, making maps on graph paper. And so, so it was, um, I, I was literally playing D&D before I even knew what a role-playing game was, right? And so then when I get introduced to the Star Wars game, the first edition uh, that, I pl- that I bought myself, so I played a D&D second edition, uh, a little bit, some Dragonlance in there. Um, but when I bought uh, my first you know, copy my, myself was third edition. So when third edition came out, and if you remember, there was this thing called Master Tools. It was a CD. It was in the CD-ROM. It was in the back of that player's handbook. And I remember cracking that thing open. I barely even owned a computer at that time. Um, and um, and basically put that in. I started using it. I loved what I saw with that right there. Now, granted, incredibly limited. Um, you know, I think you could create like two different character types or, you know, whatever it was. Um, and clearly the promise of that never played itself out. And I remember as the transition from third edition to fourth edition was going, and I saw that those tools never came to fruition. And I saw D&D Insider, um, you know, was, uh, was, was coming out. And again, I saw so much promise there that remained unfulfilled um, throughout the course of that edition as well. Um, I was putting together my own, uh, and, and I'm not a developer, by the way. I, like, I, I am a little bit these days. I, I couldn't help but uh, pick up uh, you know, some parts of it. But, um, but especially in those days, I knew how to do Microsoft Office things, you know, access databases. So I'm making access databases with VBA that are, you know, making digital tools for fourth edition that, you know, I, I, I hate to, you know, say this or, you know, pat myself on the back or whatever, but um, they were better than d and Insight. Um, and, and, and I used them uh, obviously just for me and my home game and, and the, the different players that I had at the time. And they worked really, really well. And so as the transition uh, was going on from, uh, you know, fourth to fifth edition many years later, I was working um, in a defense and aerospace job here in uh, Huntsville is the Rocket City. So it's NASA, military contractors, lots and lots of that here. Um, And I was just kind of looking at myself and like, hey, you know, is this what I want to do the rest of my life? And at the time, this video game company called Curse was um, was moving into my backyard. Literally, they moved their corporate headquarters to Huntsville. And um, and I was like, you know, I want to go work for a video game company. I'd rather do that. And uh, so I uh, called them up, said, hey, I want to work for you. <laughs> they interviewed me. They, they hired me. And my second day in the office, they were talking about, we need to get out of the video gaming space. It's too crowded. We need to get away from ad block. Um, so the reason that D&D Beyond exists is because of ad block. A lot of people don't know uh, <laughs> don't know that, but, uh, but Curse... Um, was getting killed by ad block. So like many media companies that rely on indirect advertising, um, you know, ad block is so prevalent uh, today that no one sees ads. And so you don't get paid for, for ads that you display on your website. And so uh, they were needing to get into what is called direct user monetization. And so um, as uh, as they were talking about that, uh, my second day in the office, I was like, hey, you know, 
you know, and so I was planting seeds even then. And uh, basically from there, all of a sudden, I'm not having to mess around with access databases um, and VBA silly code. It's like I have real developers um, and I am a product leader at that point in time. And so um, no one at Curse wanted to do it. But what I, my nefarious plan was, hey, I'm going to get everybody playing D&D and then they're going to know that this is what we should do. So I remember I got, you know, just strategically pulled in a designer, a back end developer, a front end developer, you know, all the pieces that might be needed, you know, trying to assemble some Avengers. And as this is coming together, I ran the greatest game of my life that um, like I, I really did. Like, I mean, it was um, full on television, you know, flat screen laying on the table. We had battle maps and miniatures and sirenscape and just at, like I was I was just on point for everything. And those folks that uh, many of them had most of them had never played D&D before. Absolutely hook, line and sinker. One of the guys went out and bought three hundred and fifty dollars worth of miniatures the next day, um, <laughs> like like they were they were literally just all in. And so all of a sudden, it's not just me saying, "Hey, we need to make a D and D product." Um, it was this chorus of individuals <laughs> doing it, and uh, and so we were able uh, to put together, you know, uh, the way it happens, put together a little sizzle reel. Uh, that lasted, you know, 60 seconds of like uh, just uh, mock-up, design mock-up screens that we sent uh, cold to Wizards of the Coast. And within uh, less than an hour, they went back to us and said, hey, can we talk? And so, uh, so basically, um, I remember that conversation and spoke to their licensing director. Her name is Liz Shu, and she's, uh, she's absolutely one of my favorites. She's uh, fantastic. Um, but um, but she got on the call and she asked me for the, you know, three minute uh, elevator pitch and knowing me as you're, you're getting to know me now, which sure was at least five or six minutes. Um, but, um, but as, as uh, you know, we were talking that through, um, she, she just literally, her response to it was, well, this is kind of the holy grail for us. Can you fly out here and talk about it next week? So I was on a plane, and and uh, and and then that became D and D. But uh, but yeah, it really was the first time that I saw Master Tools in that third edition book. I saw the potential of digital tools and how that could impact play. Because at the end of the day, I love physical things. Like if I moved and my blur, my auto blur went off, you would see how much I love physical things back then. I That's so exactly, much I wanted to ask you exactly that question. One of the slogans that you have for Pathfinder is uh, digital tools for the analog heart. What can you tell us about this slogan? How did you arrive at it? I mean, it, it goes right uh, to the heart uh, of what yeah. you are saying right now. Yeah, and I, I think we've uh, edited that slightly in some of our other messaging to analog soul, but but heart and soul either way. Um, there is something about, you know, one of the things that I saw in my time at D&D Beyond, and again, I had access to probably more data than anyone's ever had. I, I, I don't say that lightly. Um, there was so much data that, that I, more data than Wizards of the Coast ever had um, <laughs> up to that point, right? And so um, with that data, it was, uh, because again, it wasn't just characters that people are building. We had a lot of third party research going on that we were paying for to see uh, play behavior and all kinds of things. And so one of the things that, uh, that we saw was, uh, you know, fascinating, first of all, um, was that, you um, People were uh, people have really trended away from tactical combat. So a lot of people still have a, a, a sweet spot for that. I love it. I have a bunch of Dwarven Forge and miniatures and everything, and, and, and I do love it. But uh, but most games use theater of the mind uh, now. Um, and and again, that's surprising for some people. But there is no question. There was statistically significant data that said that no, definitely more games are more theater, and it makes sense when you think about the cost involved. In some of that. Um, and uh, and so basically, uh, theater of the mind. But then the other thing that we saw was that the digital sales of book content. You got to remember with D and D Beyond, and still to some degree with Demi Plane today, because the industry hasn't had a complete turn on its head yet. Um, people are rebuying content. 
they they bought a hardcover and then they are needing to buy a digital version of that and trust me i have been fighting a crusade for many years to try to lessen that blow and make things better and i've i've had some victories along the way there but um but at the same time um everyone has to get paid in order for their businesses to continue to to operate right and so as a part of that a lot of people make the assumption that uh, having a digital product where you have that content available cannibalizes um, physical sales and the data overwhelmingly refutes that. Um, in fact, there is strong, I, I won't say that it is causation, but there is strong correlation between the um, the digital spurring and increasing physical sales, right? And so, because it raises awareness and, and all kinds of things. Um, and so as that's going on, physical sales um, flourished uh, while the and Beyond was, was still flourishing. We still see the same thing today uh, with Demiplane. So I think that uh, one of the key things was that we saw that people in this hobby more so than any of the other gaming hobbies, love physicality. They love tactile, um, you know, uh, things that they can have. They love books. They love dice. Dice are incredibly uh, popular. There's a multi-million dollar dice industry out there, um, you know, and all these other things. And so as that is going on, what we want to do with our digital tools is we never want to um, to make the claim that the digital tool replaces some of these physical things that people enjoy using. Even something like a paper character sheet. We're not saying that the paper character sheet has to go away by any means. I still play with paper character sheets sometimes. I will say that's lessened over the years just uh, because I forget to, to print them out a lot of times. But, um, but I still like that tactile feel to it. So I think that that is the, the key here, that as we are positioning what Demiplane is doing, we see it fully as a supplement to playing the game. And those physical aids are also supplements. Now, we believe, of course, that our supplement is incredibly useful and that you shouldn't be trying to play without having this kind of digital support because it does make flipping through a book much, much faster, but that doesn't mean that it supplants and completely replace, replaces those things. And so I think that, um, that that is the key, is that I know that people love the physical. We want the physical and digital to be joined, not the digital replace the physical. And so that's where that entire concept of digital tools for the analog soul comes from, is that um, you know we want to embrace those parts of the game. At the end of the day, what we're trying to create is not video game technology. The, if we wanted to play video games, we would all be playing video games. And many of us do, right? Um, and, and, and that's great. But when we are playing tabletop role-playing games, that is an entirely different thing that people who haven't experienced that don't fully understand a lot of the time. But, but at the end of the day, we want to use the best parts of video game technology to allow the core components of the tabletop role-playing experience to truly shine through the collaborative storytelling at the heart of that we want to mitigate the worst parts of rules like we could play these games without rules we want to mitigate the worst parts and let those great parts of what the rules enable shine through. i i want to to take something that you said about the the, the data that you handle uh of, of course you also do it right now with with the midplane so what kind of people do you have in mind when you think about the average demi play user? That, that, that's a really great question. That, that, that's a good one. Um, yeah, so I, I think that um, I, I'm, I'm going to start by talking about what I, where I think things are going, and then I'm going to back up to where um, today what the average demi play user is. But I, I believe that what we are going to see in the years to come. And we see this with, uh, there's just a, a plethora of uh, licensed IP games that are coming. So, you know, Fallout, uh, fantastic show, wow, you know. Um, and um, and so the tabletop role-playing game has seen this massive, massive spike, right? 
and um, and I think that we're going to continue to see you know Dune has had some great uh, you know coverage as that movie came out. I think we're going to continue to see those kinds of IP participation. Uh, there's a Marvel multiverse role playing game. Uh, Marvel is the biggest entertainment property in the world, um, and so as you're looking at it in this way, um, what we have not seen in mass yet is we have not seen all of the Marvel acolytes in the world um, completely convert to playing tabletop role-playing uh, game versions of Marvel. Like, we haven't seen that yet. And it's not to say that the game's doing badly or anything. It's just we haven't seen the full weight of all those Marvel fans come over. So I, I really do believe that part of the reason that those transitions have not happened in years past is because the barrier of entry is too great. Um, and so I think that as digital tools continue to make that accessibility increase and the barrier of entry is lower, um, we are going to see more and more. So, so you know, what we talk about that as is those are the opportunity users. And so, um, again, uh, sorry for the redacted secrets here, but we've got another game that we're going to be working on later this year. You're going to look back on this. You're going to know exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> but um, but it's a massive... I I'm massive pretty sure it's not Marvel. <laughs> yeah. I, I, lips, lips are sealed. But, but basically, as that is going on, um, uh, you're going to see so many of those fans of that IP transition to a tabletop role-playing game and so i think that um having digital tools from the beginning of that process is going to be such a massive boom we're seeing that with dagger heart for instance um having full tools right from the start of a play test is unheard of it's unprecedented and it's something i'm so glad uh, that we were able to pull off and it has made a massive difference for the fans for the publisher and obviously uh you know for our platform and so I think that like this is win, win, win stuff. So I think that like where the average Demi playing user is going to be in, in a few years is we are going to be welcoming more people to the hobby than ever before. And many of them are going to be coming from IP fandoms that are now taking advantage of this golden age of, of tabletop. The average Demi playing user today, backing up from that, is absolutely someone who is tech savvy, um, who has likely used D&D Beyond um, and is familiar with the concept because it does take a lot of explanation. You all started your questions about what is Demiplane. Um, we still, when the press contacts us, many of the members of the press that we work with uh, frequently are fully aware of the differences now. They don't call us a VTT. They, uh, they understand the distinctions. But at the end of the day, a lot of people just all automatically assume if you are doing digital tools, you are doing a virtual tabletop. We're filling a different gap there. So I think that people who have used D&D Beyond understand what that uh, that that gap is uh, that, that is being filled. And so there are many, many people because of that familiarity that wanted that for other games who are coming over. So I would say that, you know, average Jimmy playing user today is certainly uh, digital savvy. They um, they are probably uh, familiar with D&D Beyond and possible users. And um, and then the other thing is, is they are hardcore into the games that we're supporting because we see so much gratefulness um, that, you know, we're putting in this amount of effort for the game that they have loved for years that they never thought would get this kind of support. So, uh, you're you're making a lot of emphasis in, in this this that you are filling a gap that no one out there was touching. You know, like the the tools. So, with this in mind, do you consider the playing to be a premium service in the TTRPG scene? I, I I believe I understand what you're getting at with the question there, and and I think that. Um, I absolutely believe that um, it's going to depend on your definition of premium, right? So, so yes, I a thousand percent believe that it is a very premium service because I believe that we already provide the best characters experience and content experience that you're going to find for these games. Um, that is only going to continue to get better. So if we're talking premium 
in the way that uh, uh, that uh, that it works and and all of those kind of things. Absolutely, if we're talking premium from the standpoint of um, you know the cost associated with it versus versus what it gives, um, it is going to fall into that category. If we're being if we're brass tacking things. And we say, do you need, uh, you know, a DemiPlay Nexus product to play the game that you're playing? Uh, the answer is no. Absolutely, we can all, like, you know, technically, we can play Dungeons and Dragons without buying a single book, without buying dice if we want to go there, because you know, uh, we we can uh, ran- randomize numbers in a lot of different ways. Um, so, so we can strip away a whole lot to get to a point of playing a tabletop role playing game. And so I um, absolutely we see uh, feedback sometimes, um, which I'm I'm about to. I uh, I'm a student of uh, sociology, a fan of psychology, green sociology. Um, but but one of one of the things that um, we're, we're going to dissect some human behavior here. So it, it's interesting to me to see that we sometimes get feedback where someone comes in and says. I really, really love what you have here, but it's just too expensive. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to use the free service. And the thing that um, it, we get that kind of feedback all the time. And what is fascinating to me over the course of you know the eight or nine years that I've been doing this now is that I can so frequently <laughs> go back and see that that person eventually becomes a customer. And, 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 and part of this reasoning is a lot of that reaction to like, hey, I've got to buy the books again or, you know, any anything else like that. A lot of that reaction is because the person wants it. They're not coming on there to talk to us about how expensive <laughs> it is if they don't want the, what we're providing in the first place. And so, right. um, so at the end of the day, this is good news for us typically when we see that. Um, we are driving costs as low as we can get them with a publisher in the mix. So we have to obey licensing, uh, you know, standards that we have in place. And then obviously we as a company have to continue to operate. We have a very small team. You'd be amazed at how small it, it probably is. We have, you know, 12 people and that's counting the three leadership people that, um, we, uh, uh, do what we can, but, uh, you know, we have a very, very small team. And so within this team, um, we have to make sure that that everybody can have, you know, jobs, right? And so I think that uh, we drive costs as low as we can get in that, um, you know, mindset. But then, you know, we would have a problem if everyone was saying uh, nothing, like if they weren't complaining about any of that ever, because it means they don't want it in the first place. But it is always a great sign for us, especially as we have started out in the last year or, or two here of like, you know, putting this out there, seeing some of that reaction, because you better believe I saw that with D&D Beyond too. Um, I, I waded into the cesspool of Reddit to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to try to valiantly um, yes. you know, ar- ar- argue with internet people. We um, actually so, have some some of your Reddit comments uh, as as a background for this. We are sharing this after all, and, and and we read some comments of of yours on this topic, and we wanted to ask you that question. So so we yeah. know that you've been in this aspect there. Yeah, a, a, ab- <laughs> absolutely. And so so I do think that that is the thing. So yes, I, I guess at the end of the day, I'm going to say it's a premium service because it is really really good stuff, and it does cost money for sure. I am fully aware that there are free tools available, especially for a game like Pathfinder that has been in development, um, you know, the, the actual second edition, uh, well before we came onto the scene. There are there are some people doing some excellent work at, at the community and third party developer level um, that, uh, that I um, absolutely love that the, the passion and everything else that's going into that. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, we are, um, absolutely seeing rapid growth in people adopting Pathfinder Nexus because I believe it is proving out that the, you know, if we want to call it premium, I prefer to just use the the, the word high quality and good tools, um, right. that they are worth that expenditure. One of the things that I saw early on with Pathfinder Nexus that was um, very head shaking for me was, um, and, and, you know, YouTubers using those clickbaity thumbnails uh you know and stuff that uh 
y'all ain't ever gonna do that right but uh, but but uh but basically as uh, as as they're doing it it's like uh pathfinder nexus cost two thousand dollar you know absolutely not it does not cost two thousand dollars if you want to come in there and buy every single book that paiso puts out so consistently and religiously like paiso is prolific they're putting out new stuff yeah. all the time so if you want to come in there and do that then sure you could spend two thousand dollars but how much do you actually have to spend to get started playing pathfinder because uh most people out there do not have all those pathfinder books on their shelf either because if you started today and tried to run every pathfinder scenario that is available out there you would literally never get through it right so i'm doing so, it I yes know. <laughs> exactly exactly so it's not uh two thousand dollars to get started it is uh it is you know a, a 150 dollars i think is the remaster bundle that we have now you don't even need that because you can spend 30 to get player core 2 or player core rather uh, sorry, Player Core Two is about to come out, um, and we're working on it right now. It's on my mind, but um, but Player Core, and um, and with that, that thirty bucks is going to get you everything that you need for this new uh, master content. So, um, so again, it is a premium product, but um, but some of that was uh, some alarmism uh, that that was uh, definitely going on across. I, I want, uh, some I want to do a, a, a follow up question uh, on what Leon asks uh, right now. Um, do you have any? Uh, we are from Latin America, after all. My first question is: is, is if you have any data, or if you remember any data of, of usage of, of demi plane from people from Latin America. And my second question is a hard question, I know. Is is if the, you are considering, of you you have thought about uh, localization, translation, and even regional prices, which is something that is something sometimes required in in uh, our region. Yeah, uh, great, great question. So the first one um, I can answer pretty quickly, and that is that um, the Latin American uh, fan community in the data, and again, I won't get into specifics because I, I don't, I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know how much is still privileged information. But I will use some generic uh, statements here to say right. that it is thriving, engaged, and very active. I will say that. Um, You know, I, I believe that this is probably a chicken and egg thing uh, based on what I'm going to transition to in the, the second question here. But um, but when it comes down to, um, you know, uh, how much money is being spent, um, it is it is not the, the money being spent is not indicative of the level of engagement. And and, and I will again, this is not a hard statistical term that I'm about to use, but I think it probably uh, It, it encapsulates the, the the vibe around the data well, uh, which is passion. Like uh, there, there's a very high level of passion that is seen from the Latin American fan community. Um, and I, uh, I have always uh, so I don't know how many um, Latin American podcasts or streams that I've been on, but I will tell you a secret. Like I always say yes um, because I I love speaking to people. Uh, in the Latin American community because I see, like, I, passion is what makes me thrive in life. And I see a ton of passion amongst Latin American fans. So always uh, great to see the data supports that. Um, but I will say that, um, again, from a revenue perspective, um, it, it is a little, it is not as represented as that uh, that level of engagement would seem to indicate. And again, I believe that transitioning to the second question, that there is, uh, it's the availability of the products. It is the uh, availability of the products in uh, native languages. Uh, you know, all, all, all of those kinds of factors play a really, really big part in that. So I will say that Wizards of the Coast, um, really was uh, you know, trying to fi figure that out. Again, I, I had seen several of the updates that have come through. I, I, of course, was involved in a lot of the behind the uh, scenes discussions you know, years ago about that. And I know that it um, has not played out um, as many would hope that it would, myself included. Um, I will say that when it comes to uh, publisher content, translations are, um, I, I hate to put it this way, The translations are much, much easier 
for publishers to do in physical form than they are for digital uh, form. And that might seem counterintuitive, but I'm going to explain why I'm, I'm talking about it. Now, when I say easier, I am talking purely from the amount of tasks involved in it and not uh, because there are all kinds of other factors that, that are at play between finding the right company to do a correct translation, you know, uh, maintain quality and all these other other kind of elements that I'm, I'm not taking into account. But on the digital side, when it comes to, you know, for instance, a player core book that uh, for Pathfinder that is in Spanish, that is uh, not difficult at all for Demiplane to digitize that and make that available uh, in the Spanish translation. The problem comes in, and and, and that is, um, that's what I will call, uh, for the purpose of this discussion, I'll call that those translations. And then I will differentiate by saying localization. Localization, when it comes to digital products, is incredibly difficult. And I say this as someone that, when I worked at Curse, Curse was bought by Twitch, who was part of Amazon. Um, and so I actually got to see a peek into Amazon, the largest retailer in the world, trying to do localization for their forms, okay? And so it is fascinating how difficult that process actually is from a digital standpoint. It is hard to pull off. And the reason is, is because you gotta think about it in terms of variables that if I have a button that is a simple save button on a digital tool, then I have to make that a, a platonic form of a button that then any variety of things can, can then hit and display in the, the proper localized language. That is fine when it's one button, <laughs> but, but when it is hundreds and hundreds of buttons, and then on top of that, you have to translate and make sure that there's accuracy there. It genuinely is such a mountain of effort. I am I am a, explaining the the, the uh, and describing how that works um, for digital tools. I am absolutely not saying that I uh, personally don't wish that we could do snap our fingers and get that done because I think it would be the most incredible thing ever if we could get to that point. I'm not even giving up on the idea that we can get there. I'm saying as an industry at some point in time. Um, but uh, but I will say uh, I'm acknowledging the challenges because it is um, a massive balance. Uh, it, it, it really is. And when you are looking at this from the standpoint of would, um, and again, just uh, using the Latin American fan community here, um, um, you know, super blanket statement and, and, and maybe unfair by saying this, but it's like, would that community rather us spend our bandwidth to cover that next game with character tools, even if it's in English, or would we rather stay with everything that we currently have and make it available in Spanish? Now, of course, the answer is both. I want both, right? But but these are the really challenging decisions that come with that. And then many of the times when we are talking with the publishers, that's where we get the clear response, what the publisher wants to see. And so I don't, I don't mean that to say that like, hey, it's the publisher's fault that, that we're, we're not making those, those uh, tracks. I'm just saying that we have to represent their content in uh, the way that our license allows us to do that. And so, um, so I would say that it would not surprise me in the slightest if we started to, in, in the next year or two in Demiplane, started to see translations. So what this would mean is, again, you have a book, digital book that is translated into Spanish. What that's going to mean is if you go build a character with that book, it might display um, some of the, you know, if it's a magic item that you're looking for in the tool, it might display that in Spanish. We, we can go that far, but you're probably not going to see the buttons in Spanish. You're probably like, like you know, th that is that deeper layer there. So so uh, uh, this is similar to how D&D Beyond had to take the first step there as well, because there is a Spanish player's handbook uh, that at least was available. If it's still available. But, um, but it was available there. And... Um, I pushed very hard to make that happen. And uh, and so we, we got that there. 
and it was a translation. But if you hovered over a tooltip inside that book, it displayed that tooltip in English, right? And so that is a really good example of what I mean between that uh, difference between translation and localization. And one of them is just truly astronomically more complex than the other. And um, and so, um, you know, again, we have to take steps though. And so, um, you know, the translation route is, is the likelier first step. And then hopefully one of these days we can get uh, to, to more full-blown localization. That's amazing. <laughs> that's that's a, a view that any of us, uh, but we didn't have it. And it's great hearing hearing that for, for, from you. But one of the things that Demiplane does translate is the RPG text to something that is in some way understandable by a machine. Yes. So you've done this with several companies and games now. Uh, what's that like? What, what have you learned along the way? about making the, the games able to be interpreted by by digital toolset. Yeah, and, and and I'm I'm really glad that you you asked that and uh, are giving me the opportunity to uh, really accentuate um, and kind of continue uh, in the vein that I that I was just you know following along there and, and that is um, accessibility is an incredibly important thing in our world today. For too long too many people have been left behind in a variety of ways in our society. Um, and again, like, I, I mean, we can literally start with the dawn of, of humanity, right? And, and go through of, of the injustices that have happened there. I think that one of the things that is incredible to see is the tabletop role-playing hobby. is a hobby that is um, truly, when it is at its brightest, is built on in inclusivity, and collaboration, and, um, and, and and again, just a social contract. And so I think that one of the things that I saw with D&D Beyond, and I am just really honored to continue the journey with Demiplane for these other games, is that accessibility increased dramatically by simply getting this into a digital form. Um, because you are right that Uh, and, and hey, I know PDFs exist, but PDFs are 30 years ago technology. Like, you know, P P PDFs are uh, somehow still hanging on because there haven't been better alternatives that have come along yet, right? It, but but uh, they are very difficult to, uh, to manage from an accessibility standpoint. And people are, are making good strides there, but they're very, very difficult. But at D&D Beyond, when we did get that text into a, a format, That a screen reader could read it. Um, uh, you know, if, if you're if you're using a screen reader for uh, you know uh, site assistance, um, and uh, you know if you are um, trying to translate, I got so many stories from people that are like, "Hey, I can run a Chrome extension that that translates this for me or whatever," you know, on the fly. And and again, I, I know that, that those things aren't perfect, but they do. Uh, to the point of your question, they do increase that accessibility quite a bit. And um, and so I think that, um, you know, the, the thing that I have figured out is that you can't do that with a physical book. So this is one of those great places where digital does make things better. And, um, and um, you know, part of that accessibility is taking that content that um, that the publishers are using in Adobe InDesign that is, that is, The industry standard, everybody uses Adobe InDesign. So so Adobe InDesign files and translating that into an HTML format, um, there are so many tricks that we have picked up along the years. Many of the employees, I said, you know, we've got a team of 12. Um, I am fairly certain, I'm just off the cuff here, at least half that team is from DMDB, right? Um, and so many of the people that I brought with me Um, are world class. They used to spend their time at Curse being reverse engineers of World of Warcraft patches um, and, uh, you know, figuring out data mining and, and how to do that. So, like, as this happens with these InDesign files, we have done, put so much together. Um, we have an internal system that we call Tabula. 
um, and tabula um, is this uh, just incredibly complex thing that is put together that we can take a Pathfinder book today and pretty much just run it through tabula uh, in, in a, in a you know, process. And the book is ready for us to then go in and tooltip and style and, and do the, uh, you know, uh, other uh, steps of the process. We can, and in fact, we're doing this right now. I'm, I think we received Pathfinder Society adventure files today that need to release, I believe, tonight or tomorrow. Um, and I might, may be off on that. Uh, I may be off a week there. But, um, but ultimately, we are going to be able to take that and do that because of these internal tools that we built. A big part of what we have built into those tools is the ability for that text to be readable and translatable by, uh, you know, machines that, that, that are coming in and trying to either through a screen reader or a translator to do that. So, yeah, it, it has been, um, you know, truly incredible to see the response to that. And, you know, honestly, just being fully transparent here, when I started the process, I didn't realize that it was going to be such a boon for accessibility to the degree that I have seen that it has been. But once I learned that, I was like, wait a minute, this is incredible. And so then at DD Beyond, but definitely now here at Demi Plain, we're taking, you know, more and more steps. We love, we welcome feedback from, uh, you know, uh, blind fans who are coming in and saying like, hey, the screen reader is working pretty well here, but it's not working well here because we were, we're translating an incredibly complex character building process uh, and trying to to get uh, the screen reader to, to know where to go and, and those kind of things. And we're, we're making real strides there. We're, we're getting great feedback there. Um, all of those things um, are, are wonderful elements and, um, and, you know, honestly started out as side effects of digitizing the content. And now they're becoming a uh, part of that core focus. So. I, I want to go uh, to another related subject about uh, what uh, digitalizing content um, brings to the table that perhaps you didn't think of at first. Uh, you've been a, a central piece of Dagger Hearts uh, playtest, right? Uh, uh, and, and you've mentioned in, in other interviews and in Reddit too that uh, being a part of Dagger Hearts playtest also kind of like um, changed the relationship with the designer because you, uh, and I, I think I'm quoting here, but correct me if I'm wrong, you you caught some things even before they hit the public. I mean, you, you when you were translating them uh, to, to digital uh, to the digital form, you now to digital medium, uh, you you detected some things that perhaps weren't clear enough or or, or weren't working, perhaps. And how does this uh, work? Because this is something that's absolutely new. This is a game that's been launched in playtest with a digital tool set, which I believe is the first time that has ever happened. What what does that entail for for both for you and and um, Darrington Press, for example, here. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, in this answer, um, I'm going to have to, uh, you know, I certainly can't speak for Darrington Press here, All right. but I, I uh, absolutely have a, a very good idea, um, uh, since they tell us all the time how much they appreciate this entire process nowadays. So I, I think that, um, first of all, I also want to state that there is a Starfinder second edition playtest that is coming I th possibly ahead of Gen Con. I, I don't I don't even think about dates anymore because like <laughs> I, I basically just sit down each day and it's like okay what, what's going on today um, and so I'm off on dates a lot but um, but Starfinder second edition is going to be a formal play test and just like with Daggerheart there will be full character tools there will be everything right from the start of the play test there will be a way for people to submit feedback directly in the character sheet i remember playing guild wars 2 for the first time while it was in beta i'm a big fan of the game beautiful uh visual design in that game huge huge fan of it and one of the things that happened during the beta is you would play a little quest you know essentially and when you got to the end of that it would pop up a little feedback thing that you could seriously it was almost like the uh you know uh bathroom um uh, you know, like smiley faces, yes, you know, where it's just face. like, yes. did you like this or did you not like this, you know? And um, and you could just very quickly provide your feedback 
And I have read since then Guild Wars 2 developers, just how useful that was to have kind of that real time feedback. So having the ability to provide feedback right in the character sheet itself. And by the way, that was just a starting point. A lot of people don't realize this, but we had uh, 12 days from the time that we saw what even, it didn't even end up being the final manuscript um, for, for the Dagger Heart uh, play test. Um, they said it was, but it didn't end up being it. Uh, and uh, and so, uh, so basically as we had about 12 days to pull all of that together. So we, we everything that you're seeing there was 12 days of, of effort before it came. Um, and so obviously since that time we have, you know, worked on shoring up some of the the, the gaps and, and that kind of thing but um but that feedback system that is in place is not incredibly sophisticated yet it's going to be more so for starfinder and we will of course then retrofit that for dagger heart as well but but even just what we have in place now we are able to not only qualitatively provide uh that feedback that people are providing directly in the sheet we can quantitatively provide information on how many people uh, in comparison to a bard are playing a ranger. Um, those kinds of things are things that uh, publishers have never had access to at the playtest level before. And in fact, before D&D Beyond came along, it was hard for uh, Wizards of the Coast to even see you know, outside of a playtest. Like just in general, um, you know, they knew based on survey data um, which again, survey data is an input, um, absolutely an input. But we, I think if you know anything about statistics, there are some issues with survey data. Um, and, uh, you know, when you're looking at that, it's like, okay, what is the most common, uh, you know, ancestry and class in d d It has always been the human fighter, like always from first edition days. It has always been a human fighter and D&D Beyond upheld that right like a absolutely overwhelmingly human fighter okay um and so um we see the same thing with uh, pathfinder always human fighter um okay but uh but when it comes to the exemplar class or um uh you know this new commander uh and guardian uh playtest class that just came out this is data and information that we can provide for paizo or on the dagger heart side all this information that we're providing that hey this many people, hardly anyone is selecting a long sword. Everyone is selecting a short sword. You know, and again, we are not providing the uh, judgments on that data. We are providing the refined data for the designers to be able to make it. And so that in and of itself, again, is unprecedented. It, it's never been done, at least at this scale before, uh, with digital tools. And it has already proven um, to, to be incredibly impactful for, for Darren Press based on the feedback they've given us. And then the other thing that is also incredibly valuable that a lot of people don't realize is if you ever have a hardcover book that you catch a typo in, the first thought that many of us have is like, how on earth did this make it through all these rounds of editing, right? But the truth is, is editing is hard. Like it just happens, right? Um, and so one of the things that we are able to do, and this is with all of our publishing partners. In fact, I saw something come through Slack while I was on uh, this uh, this call here, um, where one of our team members was saying in the new Pathfinder Society scenario, they're missing something. Like they, they're, they're referring to something that they then do not have a place, a target for that referral. Um, uh, in the text. And so the text, it, it is it is an error that we are able to catch before they are. Now, why are we catching that and not the editor at Paizo in this case? Again, Paizo has great editors, okay? I, I want to emphasize that. But we are able to catch this because we are going through and adding tool tips to this content. And so when somebody says, see this, we are then cross-linking that to another part. So if they're saying, see this, and then there's nothing that we can go link to, then we are able to catch that uh, because we're looking at it in a different way. And then also, we are absolutely, through this tabular system that I was talking about, um, we have automated so many of those intake parts of the process that we can tell 
when things aren't formatted correctly, when things aren't, uh, you know, uh, acting the right way in that. And so the amount of things, uh, in fact, for, for Daggerheart in the, the update that uh, is going, the next update that's going live, we have already caught numerous things that, especially in a play test, they're moving very quickly. They're, they're iterating quickly and all these things. We have caught so many things through our process that helps them ultimately make a better playtest packet product that they can put out. And so, yeah, that is a massive part of what digital can do. Uh, recently, Tales of the Valiant released, we had some things that was like, wait a minute, this monster is referring to something that's not here. They were able to correct and, and, and adjust this before the release of that content. So again, the question that, that you're asking there, super vital and one of the biggest services that we provide it, for those publishers in particular is that ability to catch those things and be another editor. Um, uh, wow, that, that that's actually really impressive. Um, before we say uh, our goodbyes, because we're on time. Are we uh, out of time? I, 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 I talk too much, so <laughs> no it, problem. It, it, it went too no, fast. It was, it was great. It went too fast. Really. Yes, yes, it, it went too fast. So. Uh, the last question is, is actually super, super important. What can we expect from Demiplane in the following months? We already know there is something there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've already, <laughs> I've already uh, spoken about Redacted a little bit. Um, I, I will say that, uh, you know, in this industry, it's been fascinating over the years that um, Gen Con has become this just mecca of all activity in this space. Like, you know, if I was a publisher, I would probably do my best to avoid it if I wanted to stand out from the crowd. But there is just so much, so many trains coming into the station um, at, at Gen Con. And so um, right now we are working on um, three, we literally call them the big three when we're having our daily stand-up meetings and everything else. But the big three that we are working on right now is an export to PDF. Um, so, um, you know, that is a feature that we've had a lot of people asking about. It's um, it, it's one of those things, <laughs> I love the way feedback comes in sometimes because people are like, you know, it's not hard to do export to PDF. Why do you not have this feature? And it's like, hey, 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 nobody said that was hard. You're right. Like we absolutely can do that. It's probably harder than you think it is, but, but, but we, there's not a problem with us doing this. It's all just like, Hey, we have a sequence of things that we have to do and we can't do all the things at one time. So we are now to that point in that roadmap where it's like, okay, Hey, we're looking at export to PDF. And so, uh, we've got some uh, fun stuff for Gen Con that's going to happen. So if you're walking into the uh, Pathfinder Society play area, you'll be able to visit a character creation station uh, with Pathfinder Nexus where you can have a pre-gen or create your own character and then print out your character and carry it with you, uh, you know, into your game if you want to do that. So clearly for that to happen, we have to have exports PDF working. So that's one of the big three that we're working on before Gen Con. And then um, we are working on the Starfinder 2E playtest. So that's number two of the big three. Super, super excited about it. We literally got con the, the final content that is going to print uh, last night. So I have seen the book, beautiful book, absolutely gorgeous, uh, you know, visual design and everything uh, behind it. Really, really excited about that. We're working on that. And then um, that last one is redacted. So uh, so we'll have more to share about that um, at, uh, at Gen Con, but those, those are the big three. After that, this year, um, you know, after Gen Con, um, we're going to be working on homebrew. We have been working on homebrew. Homebrew is a very complicated beast. Um, that we are trying to figure out how to tackle. And um, and we see homebrew as an absolute requirement for 5e Nexus character tools. Um, I know that we uh, saw the, the news this week that the SRD is going to be extended to the new content that is being put out, um, you know, later this year uh, uh, for, for D&D. &D. That is, uh, that's going to be fun for 5e Nexus, I believe. But in order to um, you know, make sure that we're covering the gaps in uh, some of that official first party content that is not going to be available in 5A Nexus. Uh, we want to make sure that homebrew is in a really strong spot in order to fill in those gaps, uh, make that easier. 
right? And um, and so that is something that we'll be working on. We will see that this year for sure. Uh, it's a big, big focus for us. Um, we will at a minimum be working on 5e Nexus character tools. Can't say exactly yet whether that's going to release this year. My gut tells me they probably will. Um, but uh, but no matter what, we will certainly be working uh, working on those and making progress on them. And then um, you know I think uh, we have a couple more surprises this year that uh, again are kind of in that redacted category. But um, I, I would expect that we would see another game. Um, you know, at least uh, that, that we were supporting. And then um, I, uh, we're going to continue to work on optional rule va- variants for Pathfinder. We're about to add crafting. We've got this really, really cool crafting flow um, where you can uh, start projects per the remastered rules and uh, it will go through and tell you all the information you need to know all along the way. It lets you make your uh, crafting roles like in in line there it allows you to um, you know spend additional days you know all of that that's something that will probably go live this week or possibly uh you know latest next week um so lots and lots of those kind of things those quality of life improvements for pathfinder are going to start and then probably the thing that i'm most excited about that um won't hit this week there is a possibility that it will hit next week. If it doesn't hit next week, it'll be the week after that. Um, but we have been um, massively working on performance improvements for Pathfinder Nexus character tools in particular. Um, we don't really have this problem with our other games, but Pathfinder has a massive data payload um, that uh, that has to be you know used. When you think about what does a 20th level wizard have on it? Um, there's just a... <laughs> massive amount of stuff going on and so we don't have that for alien we don't have that for dagger you know so so a lot of those uh, character tools are reasonably performant but um but we have taken a really hard look at performance and using pathfinder as the gold standard and i actually showed it off today in uh, one of our office hours um you know streams uh but uh but we've got it now to where a character that might uh that's a 20th level wizard that has all its spells loaded up and all that um it would um you know for me in our production environment it's taking between 20 and 30 seconds to initially load that it's it's not the end of the world but it definitely feels like it when you're waiting to open your character and so um so you know obviously we want to take a look at that and so this performance update when it goes live here in the next couple of weeks it is going to take that initial load so that same character for me in our test environments as we're testing this out uh eight or nine seconds for that initial load the key thing though is that once that initial load happens and then you uh the next time your character saves so you uh adjust some hit points or or, you know there's all kinds of things that trigger a save so once that saves though it is now cached and so i showed it off today and if I go back to my character screen and then open that same character after the cache has been saved, it um, takes, uh, you know, one to two seconds. So it's almost, it's just like incredibly snappy. So I cannot wait for people to see this because that's one of the, um, that's one of the elements, again, especially for Pathfinder, that we've seen the feedback that like, hey, this is taking too long. We agree that it does. Um, this is going to be a massive um, step toward uh, getting this to be where we want that to be uh, with performance and we're excited that it's almost coming a lot of things and we can see how you live day by day <laughs> there's a lot <laughs> happening in the game plan right now yeah. so Adam thank you so much for being here it was a treat having you here I don't know guys if you want to say anything I, I really learned a lot in this interview I, I, I really I appreciate all of the questions you answered even those that you can't answer because of, of confidentiality and, and everything you still uh, gave us a lot of, of info that's really valuable for us so uh, for my part uh, thank you i appreciate yeah. you having me it's, it's it's really nice to to talk to someone that is in the in in, in the industry you know but it's not like a, a, a just a strict designer for games but but you work with with designers and 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 make these these tools and it, it's really great to, to, to have the, the opportunity to, to peek behind the scene and, and see what's there. So thank you. Yes, exactly. It's like, it's role playing games today. We needed to talk to, to, talk to you and, and you are just so open. So thanks a lot.
Yeah. I, I, again, I appreciate you having me. And um, if it um, if it is not clear uh, th this really is uh, uh, just uh, the, the world to me. Um, and I I don't mean to sound super uh, you know cheesy when I say this, but uh, I genuinely believe that if everyone in the world played these games, the world would be a better place. And so um, you know I I know that that seems like a lofty goal. But part of, you know, a big part of what drives us to continue to do this is to get more people uh, and more people to continue to play these games because, um, you know, the things that you learn playing these games, um, it's just really hard if you start playing these games and you play them long enough, it is really, really hard to, to be a punk to other people. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, it, it, it just, it requires collaboration cooperation and um, and the world definitely could use a lot thank you thank you so much um thank you